In this video, I'm going to be telling you how you can get an offer for medicine at Oxford. So the Oxbridge application process has a lot of steps and I like to think of it as hurdles. Your first hurdle will be academics and that's not only your A-levels, but it's also your GCSEs. Now I often get the question, how many GCSEs do you have to do to get into Oxford for medicine? And there is no set answer and the answer is not something crazy like 15 GCSEs. Usually a minimum of six or seven GCSEs is enough to get a place. What really matters is the proportion of eights and nines you get in your GCSEs. Now I'm not just saying this as some made up fact or rumours that I've heard. You can look at the statistics for admissions in the previous years which is publicly available and you can see that most of the time a minimum number of seven GCSEs is enough to get a place. What really matters is the proportion of eights and nines you get in your GCSEs. So this means you need to be more of an all-rounder rather than someone who does takes on too many GCSEs. So what GCSEs should you take? My advice would be just take the GCSEs that you enjoy because after all the ones that you enjoy tend to be the ones that you do better in. There is also a list of personal characteristics that Oxford are looking for and you can see that on the website and one of them is academic curiosity. Usually the way that most people show this quality is by taking a GCSE that's not necessarily compulsory, something that interests them. So if you see something that's interesting to you and it's an optional sort of GCSE, it's usually a good idea to take that on and have that as a qualification because it shows that you're going out of your way to you know learn more about something that really interests you and that shows your intellectual curiosity. So the main thing to realise with GCSEs is just take what you enjoy, do what you can and I know your high school usually determine the number of GCSEs you can take so don't be too worried about the number, just focus on getting all eights and nines in those subjects if possible. The next level of academics is your A-levels, of course. Generally, it's a good idea to think of your A-levels as sort of a minimum requirement rather than something that's going to get you into Oxford. There will probably be many students applying with all A-stars, maybe even five A-stars. So it is very competitive and it's important to remember that, but it's also important to remember you don't need those A-stars to get in. You just need to get the minimum requirement and that will be enough but generally if you want to make a competitive application I would say your year 12 predicting exams are far more important. So in terms of the actual subjects that you need to be taking, uh, Oxford say that chemistry is a requirement so you do need to take chemistry uh, and generally most people take biology, chemistry, maths, that is quite a common subject combo because it does allow you to apply to most medical schools. Most medical schools ask for chemistry as a required subject but some of them will ask for biology on top of that. Oxford does not but to make sure that you have as many options as possible in general for applying to all medical schools I would recommend doing biology and chemistry. For your third subject you don't necessarily have to do maths but for me it was one of the subjects that I knew that I was confident in and something that I enjoyed so yeah I had to I took maths instead of taking maths an alternative approach is some people like to take essay subjects that is sometimes a good idea because the course of medicine at Oxford is essay based so if you're able to prove that you can write essays and you enjoy writing essays then that's a good idea and can help you make a competitive application but I would say that it's not a necessity and my subjects did not have any essay subjects and it was still all right. The next question I think is important to address is how many A-levels should you take? And I think this is sort of a disputed topic. Um, I personally did take four A-levels because I did biology, chemistry, maths and further maths. Taking four A-levels is definitely not a necessity but it can help you to make a more competitive application. And it's bringing you back to that intellectual curiosity that I mentioned earlier. Doing something optionally, like taking a fourth A-level, generally does show that you're intellectually curious. For example, you don't have to necessarily take that subject, but in an interview, for example, you can explain that, you know, you were interested in this particular part of maths, and so that led you to take on further maths. Or similarly, you could do something like, I'm interested in history and improving my essay writing skills, so I decided to take history as a fourth A-level. Something like that will do. Your grade requirements will always ask for three A-levels in the end, so it doesn't really matter, so don't worry too much about taking a fourth A-level if you think it's going to affect the grades that you get in your other three. The minimum requirements are A star AA, and it's important that you are able to reach this requirement. Um, there is no requirement in what subject you get the A star in. Uh, Oxford do ask that you get at least an A in chemistry but that doesn't really affect 
anything really you just need to get minimum a in all subjects basically alternatively if you don't want to take a fourth a level i would recommend doing something like an epq i did do an epq and it's something that came up in my interview so i think it, i think it's definitely something that will help your application if you're doing something like biochem and math which doesn't have any essay subject then you can see how an epq would help your application process because it shows that you're able to write that essay and you have that interest in medical research. So generally, while I would say t taking four A-levels might help your application to be a bit more competitive, it's not always necessary. And don't take four A-levels if you genuinely don't enjoy all of them, because one, that won't help your application and two, you'll be miserable in year 13. So the first hurdle was academic and I would say the second hurdle is your personal statement. That will be due somewhere around September time, October time. Make sure you check on UCAS when the deadline is because generally for Oxbridge and medicine applications, there will be an earlier deadline. For me, I started planning my personal statement very early. I'd say I even started earlier than year 12, probably in the summer of year 11. Now that might sound crazy to some of you, but it is quite a good idea to think about your personal statement in the summer of year 11, because this gives you two summers to arrange any work experience or volunteering, which can be difficult to find. So rather than restricting yourself to one summer, um, it's a good idea to plan in the summer of year 11, so you have two summers. So the key here is to plan early and not actually write your personal statement early. There's no point writing a personal statement in the summer of year 11, but the main thing is I thought about the kinds of things I'll be writing in the personal statement. So how exactly do you start this planning process? To start the plan, what I did was look at the key skills listed on the website and then link it to experiences that I've already had uh, that will prove that I've built or developed that particular skill. If you feel like there's something that's missing or feel like there's a particular characteristic that you can't really show that you've enhanced you, because ideally you need to be able to prove it you can't just say that you have good communication skills uh, in a personal statement you need to show that without directly saying it so implying is generally better than just saying i have good communication skills because that means nothing for example, if I was to look at the key skill empathy, I'd bullet point empathy and then write an experience such as long-term volunteering in a care home or seek out some work experience in an NHS hospital to prove that quality. And that's something I could be arranging in the next two summers. Having this extra time to plan work experience is a really good idea because you need to expect rejections. A lot of the time you won't get into the work experiences that you want. They're very competitive in a way. I feel like they're more competitive than the medicine application process itself. Sometimes there's an age restriction, but anything in a hospital, anything where you're dealing with people is good experience. Another way to show that you have these qualities that Oxford are looking for is through supercurriculars. Now you might have heard of extracurriculars and supercurriculars is just a bit of a different term to describe extracurriculars, but it's a bit more specific. Supercurriculars are extracurricular activities which are related to the degree that you're applying to. For example, a supercurricular for medicine would be joining St. John Ambulance Cadets. I did join St. John Ambulance Cadets, uh, and for me, I think it was a really invaluable experience. I think it's one of the few supercurriculars that ticks off almost every box of the key skills. Now, the year I applied was the year of COVID, so hospitals were still recovering from COVID, care homes were still quite restricted, didn't really allow anyone to get in so i had to get creative with my ideas but luckily this means you should be able to use some of these supercurriculars to help your application and it doesn't necessarily require you to leave your home for example a lot of online work experiences were set up during that year and they should still be available for you i personally did as many online work experiences as i could because although in the end i didn't mention them in my personal statement i knew that a lot of my competitors people who are also applying for the same spot would have done that work experience so it's a good idea to cover all bases and do most work experiences that you know that everyone will try to do. So there's a Brighton and Sussex Medical School work experience, there's Observe GP, there's I think there's a work experience for Spring on Spring Pod and in making sure that I did those work experiences I knew that sort of I had the knowledge that everyone else also did. Another great way to be exposed to the healthcare environment if you 
don't want to leave your house or you can't find anyone who's you know willing to give you some work experience in a hospital is the BBC documentary Surgeons at the Edge of Life. I highly recommend a documentary like this. In a way I thought it was better than real life work experience because you were able to follow through that patient and get to see their aftercare as well and their life at home which is something that's important to convey during a medical interview. You don't want to act like you're treating your patients like a robot. You need to show that empathy uh, and that documentary was a great way of you know being able to learn about the patient and create a story. In the end I did dedicate a whole section of my personal statement to one of the patients in this documentary and it's such an easy way to enhance your personal statement and you don't even have to leave your house. Even without COVID, I understand it might be difficult to find work experience in hospitals if you don't have family members in the healthcare profession. What I also did was volunteering at local charity shop. That's something generally is quite easy to apply to because charity shops are always looking for more volunteers. And it's essentially the same as long-term volunteering in a care home because you are dealing with people, but the people might be slightly different. Obviously, you're dealing with customers in a charity shop, whereas you might be dealing with elderly people in a care home. Either way, it's still people skills. It still gets you in front of a person and it still shows that you have those key qualities such as communication, empathy, and honesty. Now, all of these work experiences, super curriculars, and volunteering that you might have built up is something you could include in your personal statement. Most of the time you want to be doing so many things, you don't want to be doing the bare minimum. Your personal statement is quite short. It might be it might seem the opposite when you're when you start writing it, but generally it is quite short and you can't fit everything into it. So I would say it's still a good idea to do too many things because it means that you get to filter out the experiences that weren't as good. For example, as I mentioned earlier, I did not include any of the online work experiences in my personal statement because I felt that it wasn't the best for proving the key qualities that were necessary. Also, I felt like it did improve my understanding of medicine for example but it's not something that you can generally write down on paper and if i was to get an interview is where i could bring it up sometimes it's nice to not give away everything about yourself in a personal statement because you keep that interviewer interested by bringing up new experiences and volunteering that wasn't mentioned in your personal statement so now hopefully you should have a high proportion of eights and nines in your gcse's you should have at least the minimum requirements in your A-levels and hopefully, you know, a good number of A-stars in your year 12 exams. And your personal statement should be looking filled with super curriculars, work experience and volunteering that you've collected in the summer of year 11 and year 12. The next step is going to be your admissions test. For medicine, you're going to have to do two admissions tests. Generally, it's a good idea to do both of them, although I know some people like to only do one because it's easier. The UCAT is what you do for most of the UK medical schools, but the BMAT is what's required for Oxbridge and most of the London unis and a few others. Generally, the BMAT is required for more competitive medical schools. I'm not really sure why. I think it's also more academic. There is a section that's science and maths based, whereas the UCAT is mainly aptitude style questions. So your Oxbridge application is generally described as a holistic application, so it's not just about one aspect. So if you feel like your GCSEs or your A-levels might not be particularly strong, the admissions test is where you have your chance to redeem yourself. Generally, if you feel like your GCSEs are very strong, your BMAT doesn't necessarily have to be incredibly strong as well for you to get an interview. So for the BMAT, generally a, an above average score is described to be higher than five, uh, but a good score is generally sixes and above. A competitive score will be something higher than seven, and then eight means you're basically God. So during the beginning of year 13, you're going to have to manage all these different things. You're going to have to write your personal statement. You're going to have to deal with year 13 in terms of A-levels. You're going to have to do the UCAT and the BMAT. So my top tip will be to schedule your UCAT so it's not at the end of summer, just slightly before the end of summer. So you maximize the time you have for the UCAT, but also leave some time in the summer that you can dedicate to the BMAT. While it might sound obvious, generally it's a good idea to start preparing for your BMAT and UCAT 
early. For some reason, some people think it's a good idea to save papers for the BMAT. Generally, I found there were so many papers to be done that you can start as early as possible. And it's quite difficult to do papers while you also have school. So you can start doing papers as early as in the summer holidays. For the BMAT, I did not use any paid subscriptions or online services, but I did use the BMAT's 700 questions book. Although I would say there are plenty of free resources on the website that you can rely on. The main thing is just doing as many past papers as possible and especially for the essay questions making as many essay plans uh, looking at particular case studies that you might be able to use as evidence in these essays and making sure you're confident with the knowledge that you need for section two. For section two there should be a Moodle course I think on the website which is free for everyone and it just goes through everything that you need to know and that's something I would say that section two is something you can start with in the summer holidays. So overall I would say start preparing early for the BMAT, make sure your UCAT is not disrupting your prep for the BMAT because after all if Oxford is your main goal or you know any of the other London unis you want to dedicate enough time for your BMAT and not have the UCAT disrupts that preparation time. When you make your application everything will be looked at so if you feel like your GCSEs aren't strong you can make sure that your BMAT score is very strong and competitive which will increase your chances of getting an interview. The most important thing to realise is that the numbers that you get on paper, the personal statement is mainly just for you to get an interview. The interview is a whole different story and that's the main thing that will get you the offer. Now I would say don't sit and you know wait for that invite. As soon as you've submitted your personal statement and you've completed the BMAT, you can start preparing for interviews. After all, you want to think positively and you want to assume that you have got at least one interview for one of the medical schools you've applied to. So you need to start preparing generic medical questions, but particularly for Oxford, you need to be preparing academic style questions. For this, I would recommend going to your school. Hopefully you have some teachers who might be able to make some mock interviews for you. If you don't have this available for you, generally there are some YouTube videos that you can watch where there's example interviews. I believe there is also an example interview by Oxford themselves. And you can just play the video, listen to the question, pause the video, answer the question yourself and then listen to the answer that the example student has given and just think about what you would have said differently or whether what you said made sense. Usually having another person during this process who can listen to what you're saying and usually it's a good idea if they understand what you're saying so so someone like your teacher is a good idea and they can correct you if you've said anything wrong or they can push you to sort of think about the question in alternative ways. The way I personally prepared for interviews was I would read my personal statement first and see how they could quiz me on my personal statement. Then I would put something in the middle of a page and just make a mind map of all the things I could then talk about if that topic was to come up. For my Oxford interview, I did not get any questions specifically about my personal statement. I don't think they have your personal statement in front of you, but it depends on which college you apply to and it varies. It is a good idea to make sure that you kn you're confident on everything in your personal statement because first of all, other medical schools might interview based on the personal statement. And secondly, you might get a Oxford college that does focus on the personal statement. So those are pretty much all the steps for the Oxford application process for medicine. I have sort of briefly covered some of those topics. So if you'd like me to go into more detail about how I prepared for the BMAT or how I prepared myself for interviews, then let me know. My final top tip will just be to also make sure you're doing stuff during year 13 that you enjoy, like just a generic extracurricular, just something that you enjoy because year 13 is a tough year and you do need to somehow get through it. But also that does help your application in a way because it proves that you're able to manage with stress using something outside of your work and your academia. But hopefully that should be some insight to how you can apply to Oxford for Medicine and hopefully you should realise that anyone can do it. It's pretty much accessible to all. The main thing is just focusing on how you can make your application competitive as possible. Your first step is to get that interview and then hopefully in that interview you're able to show off everything that you've done and show all that knowledge you have and that should be 
good. So that's all. Thanks for watching. Uh, subscribe if you'd like more content like this. Uh, I should be giving more application tips. I'll be going into more detail if you'd like. Uh, and I'll be showing you a bit more about my life here at Oxford. Uh, and see you in the next one.